Welcome, welcome uh, to all of you uh, to another episode of the DC Plus Talks. We started uh, this, this series uh, at, the, at the beginning of the lockdown period, and uh, we are going toward uh, uh, the, let's say, uh, the, the end of such a, of such a uh, lockdown, and uh, this is the last webinar uh, before the summer break. Uh, so, and this time we have a, a quite special uh, episode, let's say, uh, because uh, this time uh, uh, the webinar uh, is uh, de facto um, uh, done in, in partnership with the IEA. And uh, what we will do uh, is that I'll give the floor uh, to uh, Reda Chebar from the National Resources Canada and it will guide you through a very interesting project, IA project, about integrated cost-effective large-scale thermal storage for smart district heating and cooling. So, uh, so yes, this is a, just a very short introduction, and then you'll be in the ends uh, of, of RADAR. So um, maybe just very few few words from me uh, for the ones that don't know us. Uh, DAC Plus is the innovation hub and is part of European Power, which is the European uh, in, uh, European and even uh, international association for uh, uh, district energy. Our focus on DAC Plus is on innovation is on funding, is on helping our members, uh, scouting the most, the most interesting opportunities, is on providing education and training, and is in general is in communicating and advocating for more district heating and for more innovation in district heating. Uh, we have uh, what you see here are uh, the DC Plus members, there are more than 50, and uh, on top of that, uh, we have all the uh, European Power community that's around uh, 120 uh, and more uh, members. Uh, so, uh, just before uh, giving the floor to Reda, uh, I'd like to mention the fact that uh, uh, we have a very interesting uh, instrument that uh, is free and uh, is is accessible to all of you uh, is on our website and is called the knowledge hub and uh, uh, i'll describe in a second what what that is but uh, uh, you see that for example we already included uh, uh, the latest report the final report of this project and uh, so about the knowledge app, this is a, a very comprehensive uh, database where you can find a lot of information regarding district heating in uh, all its different declinations. So you can find information about digitalization for district heating, about uh, the integrated energy system, about uh, cooling, wasted valorization, and so on and so forth. So I invite you to uh, to, to go on our website and, and have a look. You will find the very interesting IEA reports, but you will also find uh, uh, many, many other reports from our projects, from our members, and uh, uh, from uh, some uh, international organizations. Uh, so with, with that, I'll, uh, I'll, 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 I'll give the floor uh, to, to Reda. And, uh, and it's been, uh, again, a pleasure uh, to, uh, to host uh, the DSC Plus talks uh, in this period. And uh, for sure, we will come back in the, in the autumn, uh, maybe in a, in, a, in a different setting. But uh, if I don't hear from you, from you I, I wish you a very pleasant summer break. And, and, and to you, Reda. Thank you, uh, Alessandro. Uh, do you hear me? Yes. Okay. I would like to uh, thank uh, Euro Heat and Power Organization for uh, organizing this event uh, and knowledge dissemination platform and uh, hosting this, uh, how should we call it, coffee tea learn session. 
Uh, so my name is Zareda Jabbar. I am uh, with the uh, uh, Natural Resources Canada uh, at Canmet Energy. It's one of the Canadian federal uh, government research centers here in uh, Ottawa. We uh, we mainly lead uh, the development of uh, science and technology for the uh, benefit for the economic and eco environmental benefit of Canadians, uh, but also uh, and I am the coordinator of uh, this project. Uh, let me just, um, and I brought with me my, uh, uh, you see it, my uh, tea coffee mug for this uh, coffee. It's a bit early here for uh, the coffee or the tea, it's 9.30 in Ottawa. Uh, what's written on it is, Dad, we all know that you are, uh, that I'm your father. I have two kids and they offered me at one of those uh, Father's Day, and I don't know which one of my two kids who offered me this, so they keep me on my toes all the time, you know, uh, who did offer this to me. <laughs> so that's what I do, I use it during this lockdown session uh, here in my basement, uh, in my place. Uh, let me just uh, give you the uh, overall uh, IA project goal within the context of this, uh, of the IA technology collaboration program on district heating, cooling, and uh, with combat hidden power. Uh, the uh, uh, the uh, so this project is uh, project number three uh, within the uh, IA district heating cooling Annex 12, which ended a couple of months ago. That now uh, there is Annex 13 going on, and the title of the project, as you see in the, the uh, in the uh, in the invite when you registered, is the integrated cost-effective large-scale thermal energy storage for smart district heating and cooling. Uh, the objective of the project was to develop data information and analysis tools to support the integration of cost-effective underground thermal energy storage uh, in smart district heating and district cooling systems. Uh, the work included the review and the validation of uh, transit dynamic models for aquifer thermal energy storage and pit thermal energy storage applications. Uh, we completed also some technical economic case studies using this uh, developing uh, thermal energy storage uh, technologies, aquifer and pit, and the ground seasonal storage. The, uh, the, uh, there were four uh, project tasks. Uh, task A, which was the development of a, a design uh, review for uh, the current state of the art or the design aspects of aquifer and pit thermal uh, technology storage. Uh, task B was the uh, completion of a case study on aquifer integration in the district cooling uh, system using concerning ambient air seasonal cold storage. And uh, task C was the uh, case study on solar seasonal heat storage considering pit thermal energy storage. And task D was result dissemination, and this webinar is part of it. The project team included ourselves at the Anarchy and Climate Energy, and we coordinated the project. There were uh, participants from Denmark, Plan Energy, and Parallax is uh, presenting uh, this morning. Uh, there were uh, colleagues from Solitas, and uh, Thomas Schmidt is uh, from Germany, and he's presenting today. There are colleagues from the USA, uh, Jeff Thornton from uh, Thermal Energy Systems Specialist. Uh, he's not uh, with us today. And uh, from the Netherlands, uh, Arch Schneider, who is on the presenting this morning, and uh, from Canada also, there was uh, Jill Richards, Larry McClung, who is, uh, I think he's listening, but he's not uh, with us this morning. The uh, main significant achievement of this uh, project was the, as I said, uh, the development of ATIS and PTIS transit dynamic analysis tools. Uh, they have been reviewed, not development, but they have been reviewed and validated with measured data. Uh, it is cost data, aquifer cost data for the Canadian market and uh, PETIS cost data for the German market application have been developed. Base case system design options integrating large scale uh, underground ATIS and PETIS seasonal storage have been developed. And uh, two technical economic analysis for both uh, ATIS and PETIS have been completed and are available on the IE website as Alessandro uh, was uh, mentioning. So all those uh, three reports, there are three main reports are posted on the IE DSC, uh, DHC website. Uh, so that's uh, overall uh, project objectives. The uh, program in terms of, so for the program for this morning include, uh, as I said, four presentation. Uh, we have only one hour or so to uh, cover uh, this re main results or the highlights of uh, this project. Uh, 
uh, will end up at uh, 11 o'clock here in uh, Eastern Time, North America, and, at, and uh, 5 o'clock in uh, European Central Time. Uh, first presentation with, will be from uh, by Art Snyder. He'll have uh, about 15 minutes to cover the aquifer thermal energy storage design aspects. Per Alex from Plan Energy will have roughly 15 minutes to cover the pit thermal energy storage design aspects. I will have 10 minutes to go through the case study for uh, uh, aquifer integration in an existing uh, retrofit district cooling CHP system. And uh, Thomas will uh, Thomas Schmidt from Solitas will uh, conclude and give you uh, uh, the highlights of the practical tools and outcomes of the project. Uh, yeah, so uh, that's basically it. Uh, uh, the, I will ask you if you can, Art, uh, introduce yourself very quickly and then Parallax and Thomas, and then we'll go back to some uh, housekeeping uh, for this uh, webinar. Okay, I will do so. Uh, my name is Art Snyder. Uh, I'm from the Netherlands. Um, a long time ago, I got a Master of Physics from Eindhoven University of Technology. And since about 1980, I am working in the field of underground thermal energy storage, which implies that the first uh, ATES projects are uh, about 35 years old. Um, during my working life, I'm retired uh, since the beginning of this year. I uh, established with some uh, other people IVE Technology in the Netherlands and IFTEC in Belgium and in the UK. Um, I like um, aquifer thermal energy storage because it's like my favorite uh, mug. It's simple and it's excellent, excellently uh, fitted for the purpose. <laughs> Thank you. Per Alex. Yeah. Uh, hello, my name is Per Alex Sorensen. Uh, I have been working with renewable energy in Plan Energy since '83, where I was one of the founders. It's um, it's a non-profit foundation, uh, and we are around 40 employees in Denmark working for 100% renewables. Um, I've been working with uh, thermal storage this uh, the last 30 years. I'm living just beside one of the very first one, a pilot storage of 1,500 cubic meters. So uh, I have also a favorite cup. It's from, uh, it's actually from UK. It was bought from my wife and I took it over. After 20 years, uh, it's mine. Um, and I like it also because it's simple and it's a pot where you can have water, hot water with some uh, some herbs, then it's tea. So um, I look forward to present something about pit heat storages for you. Thank you, Thomas. Yes, hello everybody. My name is uh, Thomas Schmidt. I'm working for uh, Steinbeis Research Institute Solites. It's a, it's a private research institute located in Stuttgart, Germany. Um, my background is I'm a, I'm a mechanical engineer and I'm working since um, mid of the 90s in the field of uh, uh, large solar district heating systems and also seasonal thermal energy storage. Um, I also brought my favorite mug. And as you can see, and probably guess, uh, the little guy that you can see on the mark is my son. <laughs> um, this picture is rather old. It's, a, it's more than 10 years old. Uh, so for me, it's still nice to see this smiling face every day. And on the other hand, when I come back, see, see uh, my son growing at home. Well, that's it so far. Thank you. That was great. Thank you. Uh... Uh, Thomas, I just want to uh, uh, mention that uh, for the uh, attendees, and thank you for taking the time. And you can submit questions in the question box you see in the GoToWebinar system. Uh, we will uh, try to answer as much as possible in the five minutes uh, Q&A sessions allocated right after each presentation. And if we cannot get to your question, we will uh, get back to you later uh, uh, by email uh, and respond uh, 
uh, to the questions that we were not able to deal with uh, live. Uh, the webinar will be recorded if you have to, if you cannot stick around until the end. It will be recorded and posted uh, shortly, hopefully tomorrow, on the Euro Heat and Power website, uh, and or, and also on the Euro Heat and Power YouTube channel. So I think uh, we covered uh, what uh, we wanted to say at this point. If you could now, uh, I give the floor to uh, Art if you can uh, get started with the first presentation, and. Uh, you have roughly about 15 minutes. Uh, bye for now. Thank you, uh, Rida. Um, I will give an introduction to uh, design aspects of aquifer thermal energy storage for district uh, heating and cooling systems. After a short introduction to ATES, because probably not everyone is very familiar with it, the technology, uh, I will go into the uh, major uh, design aspects. Um, first, the major characteristics of an ATES system. As you can see in the small picture, um, a building which has a heating demand, it takes groundwater from a warm well, uses the groundwater for the evaporator uh, of a heat pump. Uh, through this process, the groundwater is cooled down and re-injected uh, underground in a cold well. When there's a cooling demand, the flow direction in the system is reversed. So the chilled groundwater is going through the heat exchanger, cooling the building. Uh, by doing so, the groundwater is heated up and re-injected in the warm well. Um, as you can see, um, an ATA system always consists of two or more cold and warm wells with the possibility uh, to reverse the flow. The groundwater loop is closed, so it's separated from the energy consumers connected to it by uh, one or more heat exchangers. The most common application uh, for this technology is combined heating and low temperature cooling. So, uh, sorry, combined cooling and low temperature heating. So this implies uh, preferably direct cooling without running uh, a chiller or a heat pump in chiller mode and heat pump heating. Uh, during the remainder of this presentation, I will mainly focus uh, on this application. The investment cost of an ATA system is mainly determined by the groundwater flow rate and not uh, by the storage volume as compared to other storage technologies. And uh, to illustrate that the technology is not uh, brand new and experimental, uh, in Western Europe alone, there are more than 3,000 projects in operation now. Um, there are also some uh, boundary con uh, conditions uh, required to realize an ATIS project. One is we need a good aquifer and they are not present everywhere. A good aquifer implies a high well yield and not too deep. Also, the natural groundwater flow should not be too high, otherwise our warm and cold water is flowing away. And uh, let's say for the combined cooling and low temperature heating uh, application, we would prefer to have a significant annual heating and cooling demand to make an economic feasible project. Then on design aspects, um, let's start with the well design. The scope for, uh, for the well design is to maximize the sustainable yield of the well and to minimize uh, the, the maintenance. This implies, and you will find more details in the report mentioned before, uh, the report prepared for this project. Uh, this implies large diameter wells in general, 7 to 800 millimeter uh, borehole diameter to increase the yield and to reduce uh, the maintenance cost, and also a very intensive uh, development or cleaning of the wells. Uh, for this application, we also need to allow for variable flow rates, because the heat uh, and cooling demand are very variable in a district heating system. So we need to apply uh, a specific 
pressure sustaining valves in the wells to maintain uh, under all circumstances the pressure in the groundwater system. Otherwise, the groundwater would leak out of the piping into the ground. This is an example of uh, a well design uh, for an unconsolidated aquifer. The lower part, the lower aquifer is applied in this situation uh, as the project aquifer. We find a screen in the borehole in the aquifer to pump out the water. That will be done with um, a submersible pump, including the uh, pressure sustaining valve. On top you will find the, the wellhead with the, the piping and the well housing. After the well design, we have to design the well field because uh, typically a district heating and cooling system requires uh, many more wells than one. Um, the, the scope of the well design is to avoid short circuiting between warm and cold wells, otherwise uh, we mix the warm and the chilled water underground. We need to avoid flooding because we are pressurizing the water into the ground, so we uh, raise the groundwater level. And of course we want to maximize the thermal efficiency. So step one is to have a sufficient distance between the warm and cold wells. Often we see um, that clusters with warm and cold wells are created to reduce the, uh, the impacts of the project on the environment. In the two example uh, figures you see, uh, the upper figure is two clusters of warm and two clusters of cold wells. The other one is the same situation, but with three clusters of warm and three clusters of cold wells. The background has the same scale, so you see that you can reduce the impact on the environment significantly by clustering the wells. And uh, this even more holds uh, for the hydraulic impact. In some situations, the groundwater flow might um, impose uh, boundary conditions for the location of the well clusters. Continuing the well field design, um, we need to minimize the cost of the piping and the cabling and optimize the energy efficiency of the overall system. So the preference for this type of systems is PE piping with relatively large diameters because the temperatures uh, applied in the groundwater system are in the range of 6 to 10 degrees uh, for the chilled water pipe and in the range of typically 15 to 25 degrees for the warm water pipe. So this perfectly fits with the application of PE piping and uh, it enables most of the times to avoid thermal insulation of the piping. Uh, the cabling will go in the same trench as the piping as far as possible, but the power supply cabling for the well pumps typically comes from a building nearby, but the data, data cabling and so on goes to the uh, plant room which controls the overall uh, functioning of the ATA system. Then the next step is to integrate the ATA system in the district heating and uh, cooling system. Um, for this situation, for the projects uh, with, with heat pumps, there are basically three options. We go for a centralized plant room for the whole project. Option two is a central plant room in each building. And the third option is distributed uh, heat pumps uh, at the consumers in each building. For instance, in an ap apartment block, every uh, apartment has its own heat pump. The latter one is the most complicated, so I am referring to the report for more details. The second one is the preferred one uh, for the larger uh, ATS based district heating and cooling systems. Why? Um, when we apply a centralized plant room per building, we have only uh, the, ground, the groundwater warm and chilled water piping in the ground. They go on one hand to the wells and on the other hand um, to the buildings, to the building heat exchangers. So 
uh, after the building heat exchanger and the heat pump, we have the four pipe system for heating and cooling the building. But in the ground, we have minimized, uh, let's say, uh, the, the piping. Um, we want to maximize the building chilled water supply temperature because the higher we can, the building's uh, chilled water supply temperature is, the more we can use direct cooling from the cold wells. And we want, of course, to minimize the building hot water, uh, hot water supply temperature because with a lower hot water supply temperature, the heat pump efficiency uh, will uh, be increased. One step more to go for the uh, integration. Apart from the supply temperatures, we also prefer to have uh, specific conditions for the return temperatures. The chilled water return temperature should be as high as possible and the um, hot water return temperature as low as possible. This will increase the uh, delta T for the ATAS system, which implies uh, a reduced groundwater flow rate uh, to provide the same thermal power. So less wells, smaller distance between the well clusters, smaller uh, groundwater piping, so overall lower cost for the system. In many countries, it's uh, an obligation to thermally balance the ATA system. So it's not allowed to heat up the underground or cool down the underground over time, only for a certain period of time. If we are able to thermally balance the ATA system, and there are a lot of opportunities, we can avoid uh, the investment uh, and operation cost for a provision to do so, like additional cooling towers to reject uh, heat in case of overheating or create additional chilled water, uh, additional dry coolers, connection with surface water and so on. And last but not least, um, the ATA system design has to uh, allow for heating and cooling load variations as compared to the uh, original design because it's very seldom that uh, the actual heating and cooling loads of the building are the same as they were uh, assumed during the design stage of the project. So, the, so it's better that the ATA system has the flexibility uh, to be easily adapted to uh, changing cooling and, load and heating load variations. Last thing in the ATA system is the plant room. Uh, we want to maximize, um, of course, the thermal efficiency of the whole system, allow for variable flow rates and for easy maintenance. So in this type of system, especially for the chilled water loop, we apply uh, relatively large plate heat exchanges with a very low temperature drop in the range of 1 to 1.2 degrees centigrade. This will this significantly contributes to the efficiency of the uh, direct cooling. Furthermore, we apply two or more heat pumps and heat exchangers in parallel to be able to run efficient, efficiently uh, at low flow rates. And um, it's very uh, wise to install a sophisticated control and monitoring system because um, if there is uh, an alarm, most of the alarms can be uh, uh, resolved from distance. So to summarize, um, the char characteristics of an ATIS based district heating and cooling system are uh, there are no chillers or there is a re very reduced chiller capacity required, limiting the additional investment of the system. The piping cost is reduced as compared to conventional district heating and cooling system because we are uh, delivering groundwater to the buildings. There is or might be a cost saving on measures to comply with energy efficiency regulations because most of the time an ATIS based system will comply already with the uh, energy efficiency regulations. The system is all electric. So moving to an uh, all-electric sustainable society means that this system perfectly fits in that uh, direction. 
and there is a reduced operating cost, of course, due to energy savings, and the majority of the energy savings comes from uh, direct cooling. Thank you for your attention, and I hope that uh, you have a first idea on uh, how to implement an ATA system uh, as in a district heating and cooling system. Thank you, Art. Uh, that was a great uh, highlight. As uh, Art mentioned, there is a, a full report uh, uh, available on the IEA website if you are interested to uh, learn a bit more about the aquifer thermal energy storage. As uh, Art mentioned, there are about 3,000 systems in Western Europe. Uh, here in North America, we have you know maybe one or two. So we we'll, we we'll need there's a lot of catch up to do. Uh, so our next presenter will be Per Alex, and he will uh, address the pit thermal energy storage, which is uh, popular in Denmark and maybe somewhere else uh, on, uh, in the world. Uh, for you, up to you, uh, Per Alex. Oh, sorry, no, no. But we have some questions, of course, for you. Uh, there is one uh, question, uh, if you could address it, uh, uh, Art is, uh, the question from the attendees, what ground conditions are most, most uh, suitable for ATIS? Uh, and uh, there is a follow-up question, what are the effects of surface uh, water uh, sources like rivers, lakes, and sea on ATIS performance? So there are two parts. The first part is what ground conditions are more suitable? And the second part is the effect of uh, surface water sources. Um, with, with respect to the ground conditions, uh, as I mentioned, we we need an aquifer, and an aquifer is has a wide uh, definition. But uh, sand aquifers are uh, are available in many delta areas um, or, or gravel, but also uh, fractured rock uh, in many regions uh, it serve as a, as a good aquifer. Preferably, uh, there is a uh, confining layer on top of the aquifer. So these are the major uh, boundary conditions for the application. And the other question was? The surface water uh, impact. Um, but I presume that it's the combination of an ATA system with a surface water connection, Be because there is no direct link otherwise uh, between surface water and ATAs. But if you combine an ATA system with a surface water uh, connection, you can do part of the heating cooling directly from the surface water. And the surface water is also perfect to balance the ATA system uh, mid-summer if there is a shortage of he uh, heat or mid-winter if there is a shortage of uh, chilled water in the, in the system. That's great. Uh, we have another question is, uh, this is maybe general, for both ATIS and PETIS are there indicative costs per kilowatt hour available for high level techno-economic analysis? I think uh, I will just you know, respond that there will be some information presented in the follow-up presentations and there is some information on the reports. Uh, again, you know, the systems are specific, uh, there are costs just on the storage uh, but you know the storage are connected to the balance of the system, so I'm not sure what uh, the scope of uh, the question here. But just need to be careful with comparing apples to apples. Uh, the, I think maybe the next question is: uh, uh, What would be the end, uh, the consequences of a thermally unbalanced ATA system? Does it affect the long-term performance of the system? Um, there are, yeah, there are two two impacts. Uh, one is uh, the impact uh, on the system itself. It will um, influence the long-term performance. So you need to um, locate the wells further apart if you have an unbalanced system as compared to a balanced system. The second one is that you have either heat or chilled water losses uh, over time uh, every year. So it will also um, restrict uh, the possibilities of your neighbors to uh, install a, s a similar system because you are e either heating up or cooling down their groundwater. Yep. Uh, another question 
is uh, the salinity uh, of the groundwater an issue? Um, no, normally not. Um, if 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 you have saline water and um, there is no oxygen present, uh, there is there are no serious issues issues with salinity. And in many uh, uh, confined aquifers, you you do not find the combination of uh, high salinity and uh, oxy and oxygen. If there is oxygen in an unconfined aquifer or a very shallow aquifer, uh, you have to apply more expensive materials to uh, to avoid corrosion. Great. Uh, there was another question. Uh, it asks, uh, how does ATIS compare with BETIS, cost and efficiency? Uh, you'd like to have a stab on it and then I can maybe complement your answer. Pat? Um, okay, in, in general, um, if you have a good aquifer, an ATIS system is um, less expensive uh, than a BETIS system. Except for very small projects, then the beta system is less expensive than the ATA system because you have a basic cost to install an ATA system. Um, with respect to efficiency, um, because uh, with the beta system you don't separate uh, chilled and warm water, so it's very hard to uh, uh, produce a, a lot of direct cooling from a beta system because as soon as you start cooling, you're heating up your own beta system. Yeah, I just want to add one thing is the BETIS, uh, in our experience, you know, they have more thermal inertia uh, to extract and inject heat in it. And uh, it is, of course, because we're dealing with water, we have more higher power to inject and, uh, you know, over, you know, something obvious. There is another question, uh, Art, is uh, how, I think we have only time for one more, uh, how is the aquifer uh, loaded? Uh, is it only by heat from cooling unit? or only by heat, by, I'm not sure there is a dash. How is the aquifer loaded? Dash only by heat from cooling units? Um, let's say in the, in the most applied system, that's the cooling and direct heating system, the aquifer is loaded by the uh, heat pump in winter time because the heat is extracted from the groundwater by the evaporator. So chilled groundwater is produced. And in summertime, it's the opposite process. The chilled groundwater is cooling the building. It's so it's actually taking the heat uh, from the building, heated up, and uh, re-injected in the warm wells. Sounds good. Okay, I think we've covered uh, five minutes. We'll try to get back to the other questions at uh, the end of the session, if uh, time permits. I'll turn the floor over to Per Alex if you can take us through the pit thermal energy storage design aspects. Uh, thank you, Art. You're welcome. So, can you see my screen? Yes. Good. But we don't uh, see see you. You don't <laughs> you see me. On. Okay. You're welcome. <laughs> now I'm on. Yeah. Okay. There. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, so um, I'll tell you about uh, pit thermal energy storages for district heating and cooling. Uh, first, uh, a slide taken from our friends in Solitas in Germany, and uh, it shows in one axis the costs, so the higher, the more expensive, and the other axis is uh, the size of the storage. And what we like is low cost and large size. And you can see there are five storages here. It's all from Denmark and it's uh, pitted storages. Uh, of course, if you have good conditions like here in Rostock, you can have an aquifer also very cheap. But this is the reason why we work with pitted storages. It's, it's inexpensive and you can make them very large. The concept we use, uh, we, we started actually uh, 30 years ago trying to make st storages for uh, solar district heating uh, because it can only cover maybe 25% of the yearly uh, consumption. And if we have a storage, we could go up to 50% or more. 
So uh, we made a concept in Denmark. It's uh, started in the Danish Technical University. And first is the soil balance. So you excavate and then you use the excavated soil as for banks. Uh, we use polymer solutions because it's cheap and easy to, to use. We use a floating lid because uh, then it's also the cheapest we have. And we have only insulation in the lid. We have calculated this is feasible to insulate by the sides, but it's not if you have a very big storage. And then we use water as storage medium. Um, and that was the original objective for solar district heating. But uh, storage with solar district heating is cooled down in the winter. And it means that for, for the, the liners, for instance, uh, uh, then it, uh, it's uh, cold in the winter time and they will last longer. So what we try to do now is to use the storage constantly by 90 degrees in 20 to 30 years. So that's, of course, uh, a new development. And why do we use uh, pitted storage? Uh, there's quick charging and discharging. And that's, if you look at the renewable energy systems, it's very important that then we can use it or in winter time to, to, uh, as a peak shaver, but we can also replace, uh, for instance, gas boilers uh, in the winter time if we have a huge uh, in and out power from the storage. Uh, it can be used as a buffer storage. It's a closed construction, meaning that uh, water and soil is not directly uh, uh, connected. So you can heat up the storage without heating up the groundwater uh, so much, only in the near surroundings. And we use water storage medium. It's a very good medium because it's it's uh, it will not harm the surroundings. It's a good stratification. And actually, it's a high thermal capacity. Uh, it's higher than stone, for instance. Uh, and we can use the same storage for hot water and for cold water storage because there's a stratification and it's cheap if we have the good ground conditions. But of course, we, we need land for it and the liner, uh, has until now been a problem if we want 90 degrees in a very long time. And if we have groundwater, we have some problems, it will be more expensive. So, but we're trying to get further with those problems. One example is uh, from Donilon in Denmark. It was uh, in operation in 2014 and it uh, still, we hope it will be in operation at least 20, 25 years from that. It's 60,000 cubic meters and it's a gravel pit. As you can see in the right side, it's it's sand. So it has been easy to excavate. Um, it's actually uh, an example on uh, what is very hot in these days, uh, sector coupling. We made this concept uh, 15 years ago. So if there's a lot of wind power, you can use a heat pump and heat up the storage and if if you have high electricity prices, you use combined heat and power plant and it produce electricity. And in the summer, you fill the solar heat into the storage. We call that the sun store concept many years ago. Monitoring results from Donilon. Uh, this is the last uh, uh, results we have from 18 to 19. Um, uh, there was a heat loss of 6% only. Um, uh, and that was because actually we took 10% from the surroundings. And that's uh, the reason why the heat loss is uh, so low. I can show in the next slide where the temperature in the winter period is going down to 10 degrees. And if you have heated up the surroundings, then you will get also heat from the surroundings in the winter period. And that's due to use of a heat pump. Uh, and you can also see the stratification. It's very clear during the season. Uh, some data from the uh, Donny Lone storage at uh, 60,000 cubic meters and the, the maximum capacity is, it goes up to nearly 90 degrees and down to, to 12, actually sometimes even lower. Uh, uh, thermal losses in 2016 was, if you take one 
cycle, it's 19%, but normally it's two cycles. That's the reason why it's lower. If you calculate the last year, it was 6%. Investment was 2.3 million euro. Uh, and investment divided with the capacity was 0.43 euro per kilowatt hour. So you can calc you can compare that to other batteries, for instance, and then you have to I think use a factor at least 100. Um, markets uh, has a huge charge and discharge capacity because it has to uh, it has to take all the heat coming from uh, uh, 35,000 uh, square meter solar heating plant. Um, but it's also a good thing if you want to to cover the winter peaks. Uh, investment uh, charge capacity was 85 euro per kilowatt. So that's just some. KPIs, um, and we have some dis design aspects learned by uh, bad experiences sometimes and sometimes by tests. Uh, first is if you use a polymer liner, and we use polymer liners, it can be PP or HDP, uh, you have to be aware that there's a moisture diffusion and moisture can go into the insulation. There's also an oxygen diffusion. It means that oxygen can go into the water. Uh, and then we have to uh, we have to look after the lifetime exposed to water and to air. And uh, there are tests about liners, and we can see that the lifetime has, until now, for the HTPE not been it's not 20 years by 90 degrees, but there's a new PP liner and it's more than 20 years by 90 degrees. Uh, you have to look for the price and for the mounting. And uh, normally the price for the liner is the same as for the mounting. Uh, and if there's uh, welding and testing procedures, uh, and, uh, and it's the case for, for polymer liners, and if you can get some guarantees and is it, possible to repair during operation. So we have actually repaired uh, liners underwater. Uh, so, uh, but that's for solar heating where you can go down to the lower temperatures in the winter period. If you have 90 degrees the whole year round, it's, it will cost you some operation costs and to cool down the stroids. And for the insulation, uh, even if you have Use a steel liner, there could come moisture in, in the insulation because it can come from the top also. Uh, so, use insulation that is resistant to moisture and possible to regenerate if it will get wet. Look for the thermal expansion and pressure resistance. If you look at the picture to the left, the lowest picture, uh, there's insulation material and it's actually the same material. In, the, in front and behind, but the, the one in front is only 25% of the one behind. And that's actually from Donilon, where weight from the top has uh, pressed uh, the insulation. Then you have, of course, to look for the price and what it costs to implement it and look for guarantees and to repair. Uh, the lid is, uh, you could say, the most vulnerable part of the storage. Uh, in the picture to the left, you can see Donilon from the top. Uh, and all these uh, lines, that's actually weight pipes, uh, which will guide the rainwater to the middle, where it's pumped away. So it's, it's a... Uh, important to have a rainwater system where you can get rid of the rainwater and avoid ponds. On the left, the lowest picture, you can see what happens in Donilon, where when it has been raining, there will be some ponds on the top and they have to empty it. So well, that is possible to solve, but we are learning all the time. Um, then there's coming air. When you heat up water, there's normally coming air under the lid and it can be very heavy and it can make uh, bubbles under the lid of 
uh, after one meter high. Uh, you have to be able to ventilate moisture and look at the oxygen diffusion to the, the storage, look for the thermal expansion and price, of course, and how to repair. Uh, the water quality, um, we used to soften the water to avoid problems with the heat exchangers. Uh, we remove salts by reverse osmosis uh, to, to be sure that we will not get corrosion. Um, and we have to monitor frequently uh, during the operation period that uh, the conditions are okay. Um, and if we have risk of, of oxygen coming into the water, uh, we have to use non-corrosive materials. And we have used stainless steel to end an outlet in uh, Tony Lund. It's not used in, I think it, the only stories in Denmark with stainless steel is Tony Lund. The other is with black steel. So that's the reason why we have to be very careful with the uh, oxygen in the water. Uh, new projects in Denmark are coming up, and now uh, uh, it projects with 90 degrees constantly. Uh, there's one on the construction now, it's on the left, you can see it. Uh, in the end, you can see a new PP liner, the first time it's uh, used, and then uh, it, it's on a geotextile. Um, and it's uh, it's nearly finalized the line of work and the storage will be ready September next year. Uh, that will be in Aalborg, in the northern part of Jutland in Denmark. We call for tender in September this year and it will be two times half a million cubic meter. Uh, in Odense, there will be another call for tender end of 2020. And as far as I know now, they have planned two storages, one of 450,000 cubic meters and one of 550,000 cubic meters. So, so that's what's decided in Denmark. Then there are some others in the pipeline and some, also some German projects in the pipeline. So that was all. So if you have questions, Thank you, uh, Paralex. I think we have time for one or two questions. Uh, I have, um, we're running a bit, uh, running out of time here, but uh, okay, so there are no questions, I think, at this point. We'll get back to you uh, later. I'll, uh, I'll go ahead and uh, with my presentation and then uh, get back to the questions uh, later. So we need to catch up. Uh, we have two more presentations and there is only half an hour to go. Uh, thank you, Paralex, for now. All right, let me just uh, uh, show my screen. All right, so the uh, I'll just uh, cover very quickly in 10 minutes uh, a case study we did uh, for the uh, project uh, related to the integration of aquifer thermal energy storage uh, in an existing district cooling system. Uh, here in, uh, for a, a real case study here in Canada. Uh, in, uh, uh, the, uh, oops. Cannot move. Oh, all right. The project team included uh, ourselves at uh, Camet Energy Ottawa, uh, Raymond Bolter, and myself, uh, Jeff Fontan from Thermal Energy Systems Specialist in the US, and uh, Arch Schneider, you heard uh, the first presenter from IFTEC in the Netherlands, and Larry McClung from Jill Richards, uh, an energy consulting company here in uh, Canada. Uh, who did the most of the life cycle cost analysis. So I just want to acknowledge at this point, the York University staff who were key in making this uh, case study a success. They spent a lot of time providing specs and information and uh, insight, uh, which allowed us to complete the case study. And also I would like to acknowledge uh, Bernie McIntyre from Toronto Regional Conservation Authority, 
Toronto Regional Council, yeah, TRCA, who uh, also attended most of the meetings and provided a lot of insight for the case uh, study. Uh, very quickly, the uh, cover the objective of the case study, uh, give uh, an overview of York University District Energy System, why we choose and why we have chosen this uh, specific uh, site, and I will cover the uh, integration design scenarios for uh, the. Uh, we we considered for the case study and uh, very briefly results of the energy performance analysis. As I said, there is a detailed report on it. Um, if uh, you are interested to learn a bit more about the case study, the objective is uh, the integration of uh, large-scale cost-effective seasonal storage. As uh, uh, Parallax showed you, the curve. You know, whenever it gets bigger, it gets cost-effective. Uh, so. And of course, all the all the uh, end users uh, are interested to lower their current, their urgent uh, need of uh, lowering the utility bills and summer peak cooling loads, which keeps increasing. Uh, here in Canada, as you see in the uh, uh, top right uh, hand corner, uh, the cooling loads increased in the commercial institutional buildings by 82 percent from 1980 to 2015. And there is also, of course, the desire to increase the share of renewables in smart uh, district heating systems, allowing reduction of the carbon footprint. And as I said, the increase in cooling loads, even in northern countries, even here in Canada. Um, if you are interested to know what's the and what we are focusing on in this case study is the use of winter ambient air cold uh, seasonal cold storage using aquifer. And uh, for the uh, folks uh, who are uh, involved in the HVAC, applications you're familiar with the uh, wonderful work Ashri is doing and uh, providing you know uh, in their handbooks a kind of a signature of locations where you could see the potential of uh, the cooling load using maybe the ambient air cold for the case of toronto where the york university is located there is about thousand hours where there is suitable ambient uh, air conditions where we could charge the aquifer uh, the uh, Objective of the case study, again, is, as I said at the beginning, um, is the uh, to address the general uh, technical uh, issues of the lack of reliable, up-to-date data and information on seasonal thermal energy storage applications, in particular, proved agents, concepts, cost data, technology suppliers, and experiences from realized projects. So we saw uh, the first two presentations that addresses that. Uh, we have still low number of countries with practical know-how and concrete projects in the field of uh, ATUS and PETUS. Uh, uh, that's the reason for this project and the lack of reliable and adequate analysis tools to assess technical economic uh, pot uh, potential of large-scale ATUS and PETUS integration in district heating and cooling systems. And that will be the uh, subject of the following presentation by Thomas. Uh, the, the reason why we uh, selected uh, York University as uh, the uh, for the case study uh, is uh, uh, first of all it's the third last it's the third largest university in Canada. I think it's the second in Ontario in the province where I live. Uh, the campus, the university campus, has 100 buildings, totaling 750,000. Uh, square meters of floor space, it's huge. Uh, at any given time, before the pandemic, of course, they host uh, 50,000 students and there are 7,000 staff. They spend overall, uh, last year, for instance, $15 million a year uh, on uh, the utilities. Uh, just for the electricity, they spend $5 million Canadian, uh, $7 million on natural gas, and uh, $2.5 million on water. And part of the water goes to the cooling towers we'll discuss in a minute. The uh, district cooling GSG is responsible for roughly about 12,000 uh, tons a year. Uh, just keep in mind this number, we'll get back to it later. So, and the reason why we picked up a university campus as a case study, as you can see the uh, top uh, pie chart uh, on the right hand side, here in Canada, out of uh, we do uh, annual surveys. Uh, my colleague Remo Bolter is responsible for the annual surveys we do here for Canada. And uh, out of the responses we get from the survey, uh, in terms of this cooling capacity by installation type, 38% are university campuses. So those uh, the, the largest share of the district cooling uh, uh, 
systems existing in Canada. And uh, the other reason, as you can see at the bottom, uh, at the bottom right hand side of uh, the chart, there the uh, university has a peak load of 34 megawatt, uh, roughly in that period of uh, 2015, 2016. It's consistent uh, over the years, and it has an average load of 7,000 megawatt. And as you can see, if you can see at the bottom, they even have some cooling load all across the winter, you know, because of the data center and some uh, specific requirements for the labs they have at the university. Uh, just to finish off, uh, so, and the reason why we work with York University is they're developing a plan with milestones to reduce their fossil fuel use, increasing, and to reduce their increasing utility costs. Uh, they would like, and they are mandated to bring the campus operations to carbon neutrality by 2050. Uh, they we, they are having plans to replace their aging, district heating, cooling infrastructure, uh, considering a wide range of key technologies and solutions, including aquifer thermal energy storage. So the uh, and uh, another aspect helped us with the uh, case studies. There was some uh, previous work done by uh, York U. Uh, some previous hydrogeology, uh, hydrogeology studies concluded uh, that there is a good chance, 50% good chance of suitable sand formation present below the site at the depth of ranging from 35 to 50 meters and with a good yield up to 110 cubic meters per hour. Uh, the average uh, groundwater uh, temperature uh, is 9 degrees to 10 degrees. It's, uh, all what we need is to lower this uh, natural temperature to 2 degrees, roughly. So that's a small delta T to cover. Very quickly before I get into the design, the integration uh, design scenarios, you just need to uh, important to remember that uh, this uh, campus has a, uh, a two cogen units, uh, two times five megawatt uh, cogen units, and uh, they were not modeled in transits. <clears throat> uh, we just you know, assumed uh, what we require. So the uh, it has. Uh, it has eight chairs, as you can see on the uh, uh, on the top right-hand corner, uh, six electrical-driven chillers and two steam-driven chillers. The steam comes from the cogen units. It has uh, six cooling towers. Uh, uh, the tower number one is a brand new one. They just installed it. Uh, and they have the cooling system. The district cooling system includes uh, five uh, five district cooling pumps or chilled water pumps and uh, six condenser pumps. So the district cooling aspect of the system was uh, modeled in detail in transit. It took a lot of uh, effort and time to work with the York University staff. We are grateful to that. And it took a lot of time to understand how the system works so we can model it in transit before we, ent we, before we entertain any additional uh, uh, integration design scenarios. Uh, very quickly, so the uh, the uh, seasonal operation, uh, as uh, Art mentioned in his first, uh, first presentation, the way uh, we consider the uh, ATS integration in the existing district cooling system of the university, if you uh, look at the uh, left-hand side of uh, the chart, the, the water from the cold well is, uh, this is in winter mode. So in the winter mode, the, uh, the water from the warm well, sorry, are uh, extracted. They go through uh, a heat exchanger uh, to the cooling tower, the existing cooling towers. They are chilled, and then they are uh, sent to the cold well. So that's the way the cold water is stored uh, during the winter. And we did address also some uh, uh, instances I will discuss in a minute where we also used uh, very low uh, instance, uh, instances in Ontario, in the province of Ontario, where we have very low electricity prices to produce some chilled waters as well, We're taking advantage of uh, very low cost electricity. Uh, on the, in the summer, when we need you know, the cooling to happen, so what we do is, uh, as Art mentioned at the beginning of his presentation, is we retrieve the cold water uh, from the cold wells. It goes through a heat exchanger. It pre-cools uh, the uh, return from uh, the return of the district cooling uh, loop. The return is roughly about 13 degrees C. So we pre-cool the uh, the return of the uh, district cooling uh, loop before the uh, water is sent to the chillers for top up to top it up to uh, 
the required uh, temperature, and we need uh, five degrees C uh, for the campus uh, district cooling system. Uh, yeah, here the uh, there's a, uh, it's a busy slide, but I just want to mention that uh, in uh, as I mentioned. Uh, First of all, uh, the case, uh, we had 11 district, uh, district cooling CHP system designed we did model and uh, simulated. Uh, yeah, just five minutes left. So uh, very quickly. So we have all of this is explained in the report. We spend a lot of time with the York University uh, staff to model and understand the existing system. And then we had the variations uh, for uh, ATIS integration. So you would see this in the report. Uh, the variations include whether we run the existing cogen in a base load mode or whether we run the existing cogen in a modified mode, which is just on peak period. Uh, and also we, we consider the uh, instances where we can increase the strict loop set point temperature from 5.5 5 degrees to seven or close to eight degrees, uh, the university staff are considering this uh, change. And we also looked at the chiller dispatch. As I said, there are you know eight chillers uh, uh, and whether they are, whether the steam chillers are uh, dispatched first or the electrical chillers are dispatched first. So we looked at those uh, in terms of uh, design uh, system analysis. Uh, of course, with and without ATIS to compare, uh, and also uh, there is, uh, I think it's uh, similar to most of the jurisdictions in uh, in the world. Uh, here in Ontario, the large electricity consumers, they pay a fixed fee, uh, which is based on the, uh, uh, what they call uh, a demand charge based on the kilowatt. And the also the electricity cost include the hourly fee. So that's variable. It's uh, based on the bidding process happening. And it uh, sometimes it goes uh, to zero and uh, people get credit to use electricity when there is excess electricity in the grid. Uh, uh, the uh, left hand side there is just to show you that, you know, for the, all this 11 uh, case scenarios, we, this, uh, we did uh, uh, develop uh, the project team, Jeff Thornton from TESS in the US, developed a detailed uh, transit uh, control logic for all the system. It took a lot of discussion with the York University um, Insight as well to help with this. Uh, in the report, you would find the detailed explanation of uh, the uh, energy performance analysis and OPEX uh, and CAPEX. I just want to mention that uh, uh, the first thing we did is, of course, we wanted to make sure that we modeled the existing system very quickly. And as you, if you remember, I said at the beginning that, you know, the system uh, last year, 2012, in 2019, uh, reported the 12,000 uh, tons of CO2. And we, with the system, with these, with the trends uh, for the base case system, we are predict, we using the 2016 weather uh, data we had we ended up getting close to uh, 10,000 uh, tons. So that gives us a, gave us a confidence with the, uh, with the detailed transits model. And we did, uh, uh, so there are a couple of trends here. I don't have time to go through it now, but you can see that all the uh, scenarios have a good GSG potential. And then some scenarios uh, uh, increase the electricity consumption during off peak period. And uh, anyway, so those, this transit analysis allows us to uh, do a detailed estimate of the, uh, uh, yeah, so running out of time. So the, we have, uh, uh, so we did a look at the operation expenditures based on the transit simulations. Uh, we did spend, uh, Jerry Richards, Larry McClung, spend a lot of time uh, talking to local drillers and get some non-binding, of course, uh, estimates for the ITS, uh, ATIS uh, capital expenditures. We cannot use uh, European um, uh, you know, uh, experience at this point, so we wanted to lo uh, contact local drills for the Canadian market. So what we have there in the report is very conservative estimates for the ATIS cap uh, cap uh, capex estimates. Estimates. Just want to conclude with this uh, last uh, uh, graph here of the table uh, for the uh, one case, for instance, for the two two times 20 wells, eight is the case number eight, uh, we found that we could reduce the, uh, the uh, cooling GSG by 86%. And for this particular uh, case eight, for two times 20 
eight, uh, 20, two times 20 wells, the uh, return of investment is over 10%. Uh, the various concepts, so in the conclusion, various concepts and designs consider having some potential to reduce GHG uh, emissions. Uh, the, all the uh, return investments are positive, uh, maybe modest, but you keep in mind the CAPEX, uh, the CAPEX uh, are very conservative. And we did not go into full bidding process at this point. Uh, and uh, the ATOS uh, DC CHP integration is relatively harmed for the case of for the particular case of York University, because we just didn't want it to get into the heating uh, the, the heating aspect of the university. And remember, uh, I mean, keep in mind the heating. Uh, we are a heating country in Canada, and uh, the heating aspect is more dramatic than the cooling. Still, as I said, there is. Uh, you will see in the final slide here the location where the uh, you can find the slides. Uh, the sorry, the uh, the reports from the IEA, as uh, Alessandro mentioned at the beginning, and uh, I think that's pretty much it for me uh, at this point. I uh, don't think we have time right now for questions. We'll take the questions maybe at the end, uh, or uh, and then get back. To the questions on the end, if I can ask you, uh, uh, and stop sharing, I guess, uh, my presentation. You can go ahead, uh, Thomas, and share your presentation. Yes, hello again, everybody. You can see my presentation. Yes. Yes, perfect. Okay. Um, yes, I will uh, try to give you a kind of a, a summer, summary or overview presentation about uh, the outcomes and, and uh, things the team has been working on that were not presented before and on the practical tools and outcomes that are available uh, to, the, to the public. So I just have to move forward again. Um, here we have a short outline, so I will, uh, in brief, uh, present the review report to you that uh, Reda already mentioned in the beginning. Um, and then uh, also already mentioned there was some work on, um, on validation of simulation models and um, uh, for, um, for ATIS and PTIS done. Uh, I will give you some brief main results on that. Um, I will present the geometry. Uh, calculation tool that was developed for um, for for the PETIS concept and also uh, for the PETIS a uh, rather detailed uh, investment cost analysis was done that uh, where I will show some made made outcomes to you and um, at the end I will present some main findings from a base case study that was done for a solar district heating system with seasonal PETIS storage um, in Germany. So, oh, that doesn't look good. I'm sorry for that. So we try once again. Can you still see the screen? Reda, can you confirm? Yes. Okay, so I'm back. Um, yeah, the, the review report on design aspects for large scale aquifer and pit thermal energy storage for district heating and cooling. Um, in the end, this report became um, rather comprehensive and extensive. So it, it's a little bit more than 100 pages and you will find as a, as a core content, um, uh, a collection of the long, um, long term know-how um, and practical experience for um, system concepts, design aspects, and uh, practical constructions experiences for ATIS and PETIS. So um, a lot of the information that you have seen in the first two presentations and more is documented in this report. Um, and besides that, uh, there is also a section on, um, on costs of uh, realized projects. There is a, an overview on um, available design tools for aquifers and, and, and pit storages. There's a list of technology suppliers for, for different category, categories. Um, there is also um, um, a section on uh, potential application cases. So we have seen so far more or less uh, this uh, combined heating and cooling application 
and um, solar district heating application, but there are more options. You can find uh, information on that in the report as well. And at the end of the report, there are a number of uh, project examples uh, documented rather detailed. So there are three project examples for aquifers and or aquifer projects and another three project examples for pit storage projects um, documented where you can uh, find yeah, uh, um, a lot of information on that. I will show some um, some examples from the from the review report, um, some pictures you have seen before. So there is there is a section on the on the um, storage integration, system integration, and overall system concepts for the storages. So on the top you can see uh, the example for the combined heating and cooling um, of buildings uh, with aquifer systems, and in the bottom you can see uh, a Peter system integration. Uh, into a district heating system with a high share of renewable energies. Um, for the project examples, uh, you will find, for example, uh, detailed information on, on an ATIS project in, in the Netherlands, in Eindhoven, um, that is in operation since 2001 and supplies uh, 20 buildings with a total uh, floor space of 250,000 square meters with cold and uh, heating. Um, you have seen this slide before, so this is a rather famous uh, project example for the for the pit storages uh, project in Dronninglund. Uh, per Alex already introduced that briefly, so you will also find very detailed information on on this project in the in the example section of the report. So um, all in all, I think there is a this is a quite extensive collection of very valuable information to support. Um, uh, project development with aquifer and, and pit storages and I would like to encourage you to uh, to have a look at this project uh, at, at this report uh, to find out if there is something uh, valuable for you included. Um, I move to the next uh, section to the validation of the of the simulation models. Um, the aim um, with the with the with the validation of simulation models was to um, um, to validate models that are suitable for uh, for dynamic system-wide simulations. So not only uh, the storage components, but also the integration into the overall supply sy system um, should be considered in a in a um, uh, simulation um, for the simulation or for the system simulation platform. The the project team agreed on the on the Transys software package in the beginning of the project. And um, for the aquifer uh, models, um, the validation was done against uh, a, a, a set of monitoring data from an ATIS system in the Netherlands, uh, the ARC system. And uh, regarding simulation, two, two different approaches actually have been considered um, in, the, in the aquifer section. So at first, um, a very detailed ground uh, simulation program uh, the program Modflow from from US was um, was used and coupled to to the Transys software program, so a, a co-simulation was set up. Um, the advantage of the Modflow uh, program is that it's possible to to have a, a very detailed um, and also three-dimensional hydrological model from the underground situation. Um, the second approach uh, or the second model that was investigated was the so-called TRAN AST model. This is a native transis type. That means uh, the entire system simulation can be done within the transis program and there is no need for, for a connection to another program. Um, the TRAN AST model is somewhat uh, um, simpler compared to the, to the possibilities of the, of the Modflow uh, uh, program. Um, the general conclusion um, is that um, both models show surprisingly good results in terms of uh, it was it was uh, with both uh, uh, models it was it was uh, possible to um, um, yeah to 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 calculate um, very accurately the um, 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 the information from the monitoring data. Um, Another conclusion was that the TRAN AST model was substantially faster in terms of calculation speed and much easier to use. 
Um, but on the other hand, with the ModFlow uh, program, um, it is possible to consider much more complex configurations uh, that are not possible to consider in detail with the Tran AST model. So like, for example, an interaction between uh, uh, different wells, uh, a natural groundwater flow, and also multiple well configurations. Um, for the pit storage, uh, only one model was considered, and that's a, that's a transis model that was developed uh, some years ago by, the, by one of the project partners, TESS, from US. And for the validation, um, high resolution monitoring, uh, monitoring data from two uh, existing pit storages in, Den in, in Denmark was, were used. Um, um, the first one is the already mentioned Rönningland project with the 60,000 cubic meter pit storage, and there is a second project in Marstal with a 75,000 cubic meter uh, a cubic meter pit storage. And the general conclusion again, uh, it was. Uh, the results from the simulation showed very good agreement with the with the monitoring results. So temperature development in the storage uh, showed very good agreement in short and in long term, and also uh, calculated storage efficiencies and uh, charge and discharge heat amounts uh, um, diverged only by about uh, two percent. So storage efficiency was two point two percent. So the conclusion is uh, for both storages. Uh, or type of storages, um, uh, very valuable and good models are available uh, that can be used during during uh, project development. Um, for the pit storages, um, also a, ge a geometry calculation tool was uh, developed during the project by Plan Energy. This is a yeah, as an, an a spreadsheet tool developed in Microsoft Excel. Um, it automatically calculates all relevant volumes and, and areas or surface areas for an inverted truncated pyramid uh, geometry. That's the, the most common geometry that, uh, that is applied in Denmark. Um, it is very useful uh, for, for cost estimation and pre preparation of tender documents or also configuration of simulation models, for example. Um, and it also allows for an easy cost optimization of, of groundworks. Um, and in the, in, the, in the second part, it's also possible to consider multiple pit um, configurations. Um, in this PETES group also, um, a detailed cost function was elaborated for PETES uh, for Danish and German uh, market conditions. So for these two countries, unit prices um, for PETES constructions uh, were elaborated in, in close collaboration with construction companies and, and suppliers and ordered by categories like groundworks, ceiling, lid, uh, diffusers, and so on. And um, also the size dependency um, of the unit prices uh, was, was considered here. And um, so finally, on the right-hand side, you can see an example uh, uh, with these use unit prices, uh, pit storages with a, in a wide range of volumes from 10,000 to 2 million cubic meters uh, of volume were calculated. Um, and you can see a, or, yeah, a rather strong decrease of investment cost uh, between uh, 10,000 and 100 or 200,000 um, cubic meter and uh, above 200,000 cubic meter, there's still a decrease, but, uh, um, but not uh, so so steep anymore. Um, yeah, with with all this uh, information and knowledge uh, gathered for the pit storages, um, a base case study was done for the for the German market and for this a solar district heating system with a seasonal pit storage uh, was considered uh, and for the application in small rural communities in the south of Germany. Uh, the considered con community uh, in this case had a a total yearly heat demand of 7.8 gigawatt hours. So for this um, base case study, three uh, sizes for a solar thermal system were considered. The first one is a um, more for reference case, a small, a small dimension solar system with a solar fraction of, of uh, 15% of the total yearly heat demand. So um, this, uh, this case does not require a, a seasonal storage. So uh, in this case, only a small tank storage is, is considered. And then two larger sized uh, solar thermal systems with 30 and 50 
uh, percent of solar fraction and in these two cases uh, also pit storages rather small pit storages of uh, 12,000 and 17,500 uh, cubic meters were considered um, the largest uh, um, case the 50 percent case also includes a, um, a heat pump for for discharging the pit storage uh, so if we look at the main results, so the, the, the cost figures, the, um, the economical figures, uh, you can see here the, the bars uh, show the total investment cost for the, so, for the total solar system, so including the solar uh, thermal collectors, uh, the, the storages and also the, the heat pump for the 50% for the case. Um, the blue bars show the total investment without funding and the the orange bars with funding according to the actual German funding situation and the, the red and the gray lines show the solar heat generation cost resulting from the, the um, from this investment cost and the, uh, the benefit of the systems. Um, for the large system um, also a, um, a reduced ele electricity price was, uh, was consi considered here at the moment there is no uh, no special uh, electricity price model for heat pumps in a power to heat operation so that means uh, operators at the moment have, have to pay the regular electricity price which would be represented by this um, by this red dot in the in the last section but uh, it, it is it is uh, awaited shortly that uh, uh, that there will be an extra price model and this is uh, this would lead to a to this gray line so what we can conclude is uh, the small solar system is already economically feasible the larger systems with the with the seasonal storages are not necessarily profitable on the other hand they are not not very far away and um, considering facts like uh, the the entire boundary uh, situation for for these economic calculations in Germany are changing at the moment so for example since a uh, uh, short time also uh, prices on CO2 uh, have been introduced. This is not uh, included in this in this uh, uh, study yet and these costs will increase and also the already mentioned uh, changes in the electricity price models will lead to a to a better um, um, economy. And on, the, uh, on the other hand you have seen the, the steep cost decrease of the pit storages um, from smaller systems to larger systems and we we are talking about small systems here so if we transfer this um, um, this concept to a, to a little bit larger size um, uh, we are we are very optimistic to, uh, that we are able to reach profitability so um, that's it thank you for your attention um, all the things I have presented to you and also most of the things my colleagues have presented to you can be found in uh, some detailed reports that uh, that you will find on the given link on this on this slide and I yeah thank you I'm open for question now thank you uh, Thomas uh, for uh, the time I think the time is up uh, it's, uh, already one hour and a half uh, we received a couple of questions I uh, we will uh, maybe uh, respond to them by e email. Uh, uh, okay, let me just uh, give you one question for you since you concluded, uh, uh, Thomas. There is a question, uh, is solar district heating system for higher solar fraction? The whole is the solar system, is solar, sy solar district system, is solar district heating systems for higher solar fraction period. The whole system is more or less dependent on the load which is usually not predicted with high accuracy. So the simulated output of system can be highly vary from actual output. You see the question. So in this case, it's good to have a large solar fraction. Yeah, no, it's a very good question. Actually, that's that on the one hand side shows um, that it's very important not to only focus on the storage device, but to include the entire system and the load. That's true is, is, is one of the main uh, boundary conditions and also I agree that very often the load prediction is one of the weakest part in the in the entire investigation so we um, we are doing this this work since uh, yeah, yeah since since quite a lot uh, uh, of time so uh, since many years we, we we have a lot of experiences with simulated 
uh, load predictions and also with monitored load predictions. And what we also normally do is if we have the system simulation, we can also easily make a sensitivity analysis and vary the load in, in, uh, yeah, in the amount of heat that, that has to be delivered as well as in temperature levels. And then we can see um, how sensitive the entire system reacts on a variation of, of, uh, of for example, load conditions and also um, yeah, other weather conditions and so on. So also here, the system simulation is a very good uh, instrument to get more confidence in the, in the design of the entire system. Thank you, Thomas. May, I would like uh, at this point something. Sure, go ahead, uh, Parallax. Yes. Yeah, because also if uh, the solar irradiation will be plus 15 or minus 15 percent from the normal, where well, that's uh, so. But what happens if there's a lot of solar is that the return temperature will go up, uh, and uh, it means that the temperature into the solar system will will be higher and the production will be lower. So it will regulate in a way itself uh, a bit. So so normally uh, we hit quite well. <laughs> that's a good point. I think that's all the time we have for today. I would like to thank uh, uh, the uh, presenters. Uh, it has been a, a real pleasure and a privilege to work uh, with you guys uh, on this project. I would like to thank the attendees who took the time to listen in and I will encourage you to uh, download the free reports and uh, go through them if you're uh, uh, interested by the presentations. And I would like to also now to thank our host, the Euro Heat and Power, who gave us this platform to share this uh, experience and results with you guys. Thank you again and uh, to the pleasure to meet you uh, in, a, in the f in near future. Thank you and bye-bye.